so lovely to have you all here today. Today we're going to hear from two dynamic speakers about the power of arts and culture in helping us win the world we want. So Ahmed Nomadic Ali is a Somali Canadian poet, writer, actor, musician, and youth activist. He's a former Edmonton Poet Laureate and has won awards for his work. And, and Carissa Halton, who I will disclose is a very good friend, um, is an award-winning writer, speaker, and facilitator. Her essays have appeared in magazines and newspapers across the country. Um, her creative nonfiction has been anthologized. She's won um, both Alberta National Magazine Awards, and um, her essays are featured in her debut book, Little Yellow House, Finding Community in a Changing Neighborhood. It really is a wonderful read. I highly recommend it. It's a really sweet and funny exploration about life and heartbreak and resilience in Alberta Avenue in here in Edmonton and it was a finalist for 2019 Edmonton Book Prize. Um, please find a copy. She's raised in Crow's Nest Pass in southern Alberta, community rich with stories. She now lives here in Edmonton with her husband, three kids, two cats, many fish, and one <laughs> beehive. Um, I'm so, so happy and proud to share her historical novel will be published by New West Press in fall 2025. And so today she'll present a historical account of artists who use their craft to bring social justice to the masses. I'm wanting to talk about some historical examples of some artists that kick some political ass. Curious about who in this room loves being part of an audience, any kind of audience, you know, of any kind of art. Okay, we got no haters, oh, only one. You're not into it? Okay. I'm glad you don't mind being an audience in talks. How many consider yourself an artist? Shout out what you do. Just painting music. Painting, po poetry and dance. Any other ones? Gardening, awesome. Gardening, theater. I wanted to sort of just think through my drives as an artist, um, just really quickly to sort of set, set this context. The artistic drive in my mind is evolutionary, right? I mean, there's like this innate drive to create that I can't explain, it makes me kind of sick if I don't do it enough. And when I do it, I feel this deep, deep relief. For me, there's an evolutionary quality to art. We must do art. And for those folks who said they aren't artists, I would suggest probably there's many areas in your life where art happens that maybe isn't acknowledged by the zeitgeist as being valuable art. But I would argue is probably art all the same. There's an intellectual interest that I have as well to understand what does this all mean? Writing for me, of course, is driving this interest to just try and understand the world and my part in it. The other things that drive my art would be spiritual. I'm inclined to understand my connection to the world. The spiritual that is not just, it's not about God, it's about the interconnectedness of all creatures. And I think art often guides us and leads us to that. And we can see how that can often actually put a stamp on our political theory as well. I go to art because I want to be social. Uh, I want to participate in something that's larger than me. A larger, of course, as a writer, I'm often in, interested in the conversation, not just me talking, but interested in sparking other people to think about other things and to build on that idea even more that then leads me to new discoveries and new intellectual learnings. Artists performative, even for writers. Writers actually think of us as being really like kind of in our little attic rooms, you know, writing quietly to ourselves. But there's so much of an element of performance in writing because you are always thinking of the audience. Otherwise, it's journaling, right? And so the performative element, of course, that comes from thinking about an audience, reading that work, and feeling moved or interested or shaken, connected, that for me is a, a pretty big drive. And there's endorphins to that. Of course, there's endorphins to us doing this kind of work as well. And then, of course, there's my interest sometimes in financial gain. Um, you can dream, right? There is not a lot of money in the arts, um, but there is a little bit. And so sometimes one can, I guess I would say it's like a big 50-50 draw, you know, <laughs> like an Oilers 50-50 draw, maybe, you know, like a Lotto 649. You never know. You could be Stephen King. I won't be, but I hope that dream for you. 
then of course there's the political. Not all artists are driven by this, but I'm really driven towards a call to action. I'm driven to sort of see how can my art and the magic of the art, which is emotional and, and barking and interesting and fun and engaging, all those things that art does for us, I think of it, how can we use those things in order to move people not just to cry, to call their MLA? you know, or uh, to inspire change, to go out and meet their neighbors and then to be building something at a community-based level. That was what Little Yellow House really was or bigger federal kinds of issues. This is the fun cover of Little Yellow House. It's kind of light and dark at the same time. I've had people say, I couldn't finish it, it was too dark. Well, that was some of my, probably my political drive, but also my intellectual drive. What the heck is happening? I moved into this community, um, Alberta Avenue, and people always just said, why did you live, move there? And I had to explain myself why I was living in Alberta Avenue. It had such a bad reputation. Like, people only knew it for drugs and, and all sorts of, and prostitution. And they said, well, you'll move when your children go to school, or when you have children. At that time, I didn't have kids. And then we had kids, and we had three kids. Nothing, we didn't move. We just bought new furniture. The couches changed with every child. I kept finding them in alleys and in the Bissell Center. Then they started saying, you're gonna move when the children go to school. And I, and of course the children went to the local public school. And we kind of found ourselves in a community that we loved. And I wanted to understand how is it possible that we can have such a different perception of a place from the outside. And on the inside, I can have such a different experience from a place. But also, how is it that I can have such a different experience in this home, in the Yellow House, and my neighbor three blocks down can have such a different experience in their home? It was really an exploration in my neighborhood, and I wanted in some ways to write a literary, if you want to call it, a literary collage <laughs> of this community that ultimately was changing. It was in the middle of gentrification. I wanted to capture it almost like, you know, when you're a teenager, like, you're never going to look like that again. Thank God, maybe, you know? <laughs> but, you know, it's important to capture that moment of being a teenager. And I thought Alberta Avenue is in this kind of key pendulum swinging kind of time where there's lots of house, you know, changes in, in house ownership. And I wanted to capture it as it was when I moved um, in, in 2012 when I began writing the stories. Some of these stories are, of course, just funny stories for myself, but some of the stories are I come from my journalistic you know, background, and my interest to tell other people's stories, and I do it in a creative narrative way. Um, and a lot of it was, in some ways, I had, if you think about the performance and, and the call to action in mind, I remember writing this one story about uh, a guy named Bill who's in a rooming house, and he starts saving all these cats, and he doesn't have any money, he can't get them spayed, but he's ultimately trying to protect these cats from becoming feral. So he's touching them, right? Because if you have stray cats and you don't touch them, then they they go feral and then they get killed and you know etc. But he wanted to keep them from being feral, so he started getting all these cats, touching the cats, trying to protect the cats, and then he, of course, started trying to give the cats away to small children on the school route. His neighbor saw him and thought that this was a pedophile because he had this giant, really gross-looking plywood sign behind him that said "Free Kittens." And she goes across. She's like, "Yeah, free kittens." I. She said, "You want one?" And he said, "I want to see one." She was said, "I want really want to see a free kitten." So he took her up to his you know, top floor of the rooming house and he showed her he had butter or he had some margarine, he had some noodles and he had cat food in his open cupboards. She could see that's all he had to eat. He had, sure enough, these two little batches of kittens. And so Jillian, who worked for the government for six figures or something, who lives across the street, she says, well, what are you planning with these kittens? And he says, well, I just gotta give them away. He's like, she's like, you can't give all the kittens away to the children. Like, there's just gonna be more. You need something more permanent. So they created this team called, I like to call them Team Billion, because it's Bill and Jillian. And every time someone on the street saw a stray kitten, cat, they would call Team Billion, and they would, she would get in her wagon, pick up Bill, and they would go out and get that cat and get them spayed. And of course, Jillian's money helped that. Um, over time, though, Bill became more and less and less safe, a bit similar like the cats. So he ended up moving to another rooming house, and then he was about to get kicked out. His uh, power had gotten turned off. The water was turned off. This real douchebag of a landlord guy was, was trying to um, kick out all of the tenants. And she comes across to the street. She's checking in on him to say, because she was going to Australia to, to do a PhD. 
She says, are you ready to take care of my cats at the house and the dog? And she realizes there's no power, there's no water, it's cold in this, apart, in this suite. And she says, what's going on, Bill? And Bill's like, doesn't want to tell her because he feels uncomfortable, he doesn't know what she's going to say. He knows he has a responsibility to her cats and her dog, though, right? And she says, Bill, you've got to just move into my house. I'm going to be gone for six months to so Australia. It's no sense, you know, you moving somewhere else. So Bill moved into Jillian's house across the street from his um, rooming house. And Jillian, Billy, and Bill had this really quite an odd relationship. I mean, this was an odd-looking guy. He'd been off work for 25 years from a broken back. He'd lived for many years in the inner city. And here was Jillian, who lived quite a different life. And the two of them coexisted in, in the house. In the end, she came back from Australia. And, and when he went, he was set to move away. And she said, hey, Bill, like, let's see if this works out. So that's one of the stories, is this odd gr couple of roommates you know, that got together. Because in many ways, they had a shared passion, right? They both loved cats. If I was Jillian, there sure as hell never would have been a relationship because I don't care enough about feral cats, right? But maybe you do. So, you know, you could have had that relationship too. But my point around politics, though, is I always in my head in that story, I wanted to tell the story of the housing insecurity as it related to Bill, right? Bill was extremely um, precarious when it came to his housing, and I tell that story in that, in that essay more, more deeply. I had in mind people who were bylaw officers. I had in mind people that established zoning laws. I had those people in mind because I wanted them to know Bill. And I wanted them to think about Bill when they began to do the work that they had in those offices that they had. I also wanted people to think about the fact that we don't have Jillians on every block. We cannot depend on the kindness of strangers and the amazing kind of magic that can sometimes happen when two people who have the same passion find themselves in the same place and able to respond to that problem in the same way together. That was an incredible reality that they had that sparked, beautiful, organic, we don't have Jillians everywhere, and we need something bigger and deeper and broader to be able to support the, the bills um, of our world. And so that's kind of how I've approached my politics in writing is I want to tell stories because I think stories at the end are what people remember. People remember the margin and the cat food and the, the, the pasta, right, in that little tiny um, room at the top of a really gross house, right, as I describe it. And I wanted them to think about Bill at the imp most important things. I want to talk a little bit about my next project, though, actually, because it's fiction. I've moved into the fiction world, and it's hard. <laughs> I, you know, plots and characters and, like, you know, climax, all that shit. It's really hard. My research is a fiction project. North America's first elected labor council was a red council. In 1933, in Blairmore, Alberta, we had, of course, uh, mine strikes happening throughout 1932, very radical um, and terrible things happening. About a thousand men had already been killed in Alberta mines by 1928. So a thousand workers, more than a thousand workers, had died in the Alberta coal fields in the 20 plus year period of when they'd been mining coal in Alberta. So we're talking about deadly place to work. Um, we don't even talk there about how many people were injured, which were many, many, many more. The mine workers tended to be a lot more radical. The communism at the time was um, kind of a thing. If you remember, 1917, the Russian Revolution. And then, of course, there was attempts at revolution throughout Europe. What the communists ended up doing, Communist Party of Canada, is they actually organized a labor union. And it was called Canadian Mine Workers Union. They had a big strike in 1932. In the end, when they lost the strike, they decided that they were going to put up a whole slate of um, Canadian mine workers to challenge the councillors at the time. And of course, the councillors were connected to the police who, through the course of the strike, had used batons, had the injured people, and there had been all sorts of huge strife with the way that the police had been used essentially as henchmen for the town's only mine owner, right? And so the mine workers, as they thought, well, we lost, kind of lost the strike. <laughs> they didn't really win many gains. Um, but they thought, what we can do is we can maybe take some political action and fire that, you know, police chief's ass, right? It was basically their thinking. Well, that's what they did. They put up a slate. The energy was 
for them. Um, the town, of course, all the most of the voters were mine worker families. And um, this is the first um, labor union that ever was elected in North America. It was elected in Blairmore, Alberta, which, if surprise, surprise, the heart of uh, very different politics right now. Um, and I, want, I use this photo because the top, you can see the workers of the world unite. That was something that was being used at the time by communists across the world, this idea that we need to unite together um, to challenge the means of production and the power in the boss class. Here they are. Not all of them were communists, I will say. Um, many of them were labor unionists that got involved in their local la labor union and didn't really have any understanding of the deeper philosophical and monetary ties and connections that, that, that they may have had in some ways directly with um, Stalinist Russia. My book was interested in how are those ties connected? <laughs> and, um, and I also wanted um, to tell the, and of course I wanted to tell the story of the Communist uh, Council, which, you know, there's all sorts of sex, drugs and rock and roll, which is super, super fun. I wanted to talk about the women though. The women of the 30s, of course, they were very active in these political movements as well. And so this is what got me into writing fiction was because there's not many stories about women. Um, there's a lot of stories about men, um, but there's not many stories about women. As I started looking for research from that time, um, it's very hard to actually find first-person narrative accounts, a little like what I wrote in Little Yellow House, I was looking for from 1928 and 1933 in Blairmore, Alberta. And oh my God, I found Dorothy Livesey. Livesey writes all about the coal mining towns in the New Frontier, which was a left-wing um, magazine at that time. She was a poet. She won the Governor General Award for Poetry two times in the 40s. I I won't read her work, but her work is really beautiful and it's very specific about labor at that time. It's specific to the scenario that folks were experiencing on the ground. Um, she doesn't write about flowers or the beauty of the mountains. She really took an activist um, perspective on her poetry and her poetry is extremely political but also insightful for people like me. I just want to capture sort of her comment about communism. I thought this was really interesting. She writes in her book, Right Hand, Left Hand, uh, about this time in the 1930s. And uh, she writes about communism, right? We called for a united front. So she says, I was active mostly on the cultural front, writing agitprop plays and by spring becoming involved in the anti-war movement. We called for a united front of youth against war. I learned a great deal about communist tactics of penetration and cam camouflage, but I was too committed to be shocked. It was only years later that the false actions and factional tactics were revealed to me in their real light. This did not cause me to hate the communists or to red bait. However, I was disgusted with myself for having been so duped. But I believe I let myself be duped because no one else except for the communists at that time seemed to be concerned about the plight of our people, not to be aware of the, the threat of Hitler and war. These things they saw clearly and they did extend brotherhood to the down and out. Certainly the communist predictions of capitalist depression followed by fascism war were deeply accurate. So I just want to give you a sense of, of course, our political movements are based in time and place, right? And for this time, as I'm going to be talking about this, I, I guess if you have an issue with Stalin and Russia, uh, so do I. Um, I just want to acknowledge that there's, also, there's a lot of nuance to this time, and so much of this time was driven by the economic, by the evident um, depression and challenge that most people in Canada were facing in terms of being able to meet their basic needs. Does it remind you of a time, like maybe like now? Dorothy Livesey was key, and this is how I found the Progressive Arts Group, and I just want to talk about that today, um, because this group, in my mind, offers us an interesting example of how arts and politics can intersect. The Progressive Arts Club was formed by Dorothy Livesey and a bunch of other um, leftist writers. It started in Toronto in 1928, but then it spread to a bunch of other cities. Ultimately, their interest was in first to increase Canadian content. At that time, there wasn't many Canadians writing about Canada um, in the arts. They had a left-wing motivation. They wanted left-wing attitudes to be something that became more mainstream. Um, and they, of course, wanted to involve art in the labor struggle, right? The class struggle um, by using, in many ways, they used stories of folks 
on the ground who weren't getting any play in the major media. They wanted to be able to bring those voices and bring those stories forward. And so there's three groups. There was writers, there was visual artists, which include like cartoonists, linograph um, makers, um, all, uh, vi of course, big visual artists as well. And then there was the theater club, which of course were actors, producers, directors, all the things. So the writers, just as a little background, produced this magazine called The Masses, which is super fun to check out if you've got some time. Um, our good friend Andrea Hassenbank, if you know her, she wrote a wonderful article in the Jacobin. I'm going to be quoting her a little later on. But she writes about The Masses as, think of it as a zine before punk culture. The fun added feature, though, that if you had it on hand, you actually could be arrested and deported for sedition. This is a fucking real thing. In Canada, you could be um, deported for carrying literature that wasn't even extreme. We're talking like literature that called for workers um, to stay alive by the end of their shift. They write this, and I think it's just an interesting quote. The good artist is the revolutionary artist. The artist who, however poor he may be mechanically, strives to express the ideas of the future ruling class, the working people. So that's from the masses. So the writers were producing the masses, and then we had the theater people create this, what they called the workers' theater. Workers' theater, not a ton actually on it, written in the historical record. I find it so fascinating, um, but they, Ultimately, you can see sort of two of their intended goals. To produce militant working class art and literature, so to register popular complaint about the economic crisis of the 30s in Canada. In other words, like, oh my God, look at our life. It sucks, and we should make change. They also wanted to use drama to expose and ridicule what was considered to be an exploitive bourgeoisie society. They wrote plays based on a drama rooted in the lives and struggles of those who toiled in Canada. There's this one kind of cute article that was written um, in the, the Star, and it says, 3,000 strikers, I just think it gives such a good image of, of what they were doing. 3,000 strikers and their friends crowded into the Old Brook Steam Motor Plant last night for an entertainment provided mostly by the Progressive Arts Club. Three short plays dealt with the strife between labor and capital. The curtain was made from an old awning. The plays were all right, but some of the language was pretty rough for an audience with children in it, one striker observed. Stratford working men aren't used to that yet. The actors wore the standardized workers' theater costume of black sateen trousers and shirt set off with a red handkerchief. The highlight of the evening was the performance of Nick Zynick, of course, and this was an instance where RCMP killed Nick in um, Montreal. Again, taking the stuff that was happening at the moment in real time, turning it into product, and then performing it to 3,000 people. This is a little ad in the Young Workers magazine, and it says the Progressive Arts Club will send working class plays for a small charge to organizations doing dramatic work. They had a tactic of ultimately writing plays that they could share then with all the other agitprop theater um, political theaters all around Canada. I wanted also to show you this really interesting clip I found also in The Young Worker. Um, it's basically the mouthpiece of the Young Communist um, uh, Club. And in their number six, of the, in terms of their strategic plan, their sixth strategy to form an agitprop committee to systemize education. They saw this work of art as being critical to their political goals. Um, which, again, I, it made me wonder, where have I ever seen, I do strategic planning for a living, and there's very rarely that anything about art ever shows up in those times, and I guess I'm curious about that, and I hope that we, that changes it. You can see, though, that why they saw value, right? They're writing a short pantomime to be enacted by the agitprop troops at various mass meetings throughout this country. The pantomime is calculated to popularize the young worker better than any speech could. This is a bit different in this time. Theater that was then is like our YouTube now, is like our Facebook now, is like our, you know, is, uh, there's all sorts of ways that we do this type of thing now differently than maybe sending out scripts. Um, but I would argue that we don't actually use 
it, it quite as tactically or strategically as they did before. So there's hundreds of radical theater troops. They performed throughout the 1920s and 30s. A lot of them were in the ethnic communities, the Finns, the Ukrainians, the Russians, um, the Polish workers. All of these groups had agitprop. And when I say agitprop, it means agit agitation and propaganda together. Um, I kind of love how just on the nose that is. It's like, we're doing propaganda, guys. Like, let's just do it. Many of these groups were observed by the RCMP because of um, Section 98, which was part of the War Measures Act from World War I that had extended into the 1930s. This is the RCMP in their reports. They were uh, spies. They generally were at plays like this at any kind of event. Like, I don't know, who's an RCMP officer here? I'm curious. Um, <laughs> They say, this play was very interesting from the Bolsheviks' point of view. It represented the most miserable life of the working class under the capitalist system in Russia. And after this change took place in that country, the workers possessed all the wealth and used the same for their own benefit. There were about 150 present, composed of Ukrainians and a few Russians and Jews. So there you go. The RCMP was watching very carefully. They were very, very scared of what this movement could do in Canada. I just wanted to talk about one of the more influential plays that the Progressive Arts Company did. Tim Buck was a communist leader at the time. He was arrested with seven other of his leaders. The Communist Party in 19... 32 was illegal, right, made illegal. And then, of course, the party offices were invaded. Where they came to the party offices and they arrested all their leaders. You'll see the program that the arts club ended up gathering. Again, they're kind of a group that they can just mobilize like that, right? And they're like, holy hell, our leaders just got, you know, taken into, put to jail. They were charged and convicted. And then they were basically sentenced with four years of hard labor. Um, and many of them were, were going to face deportation after their labor was done. And so they ended up writing a play all about it. They ultimately performed it one time, the star describing the event. Ultimately, they focus on the fact, which of course was what the bourgeoisie play press was doing at the time, was they focused on um, the fact that the audience booed um, God Save the Queen and cheered for the international, right? And so this was always the, the interest of the external press was to sort of show the, the not just the ridiculousness, um, but also to focus on the fact, on this, the difference between this group. These folks don't don't support Canadian values, which is fundamentally British, is what this newspaper is saying. The eight men speak were prohibited. All the theaters who were set to play it were threatened with losing their licenses, um, and all of them had to cancel the performances. Winnipeg tried, and in fact, um, the theater there had their license revoked. So the play only got presented in that one time. However, it was presented at this one sort of little tiny meeting in Toronto where what they called the Red Squad, which was the Toronto police force, had created a police um, division that was just set up to basically sniff out communists and to spy on them. The Red Squad was there and the fourth act was performed at this meeting. And then the leader at that time um, of the meeting had said something about basically that this, you know, this was the right thing and that Bennett, he, he said something about Bennett that the RCMP functioned saw as sedation or as bringing, encouraging a revolution. And so they arrested the man and this man's court case ended up leading to all sorts of embarrassment and an increase in awareness by can Canadians about what many of these left wing and labor leaders were facing at the hands of the political system and the judicial system. The embarrassment of it led to the Bennett government actually releasing the eight um, the communist leaders uh, in only after two years of labor. Buck ends up having this big giant celebration. There is um, an insane amount of people there. We're talking at the Maple Leaf Gardens. Um, they, and if, remember, this is a party that is illegal at the time. Um, Buck, they had 17,000 people inside Maple Leaf Gardens and then 8,000 people standing outside. The Progressive Arts Club presented all of that. They designed the art. They also presented that photo of Stalin at the top, which is maybe not their best moment, um, but it was part of their job then was to rally folks around, I mean, the political values. Protests were happening all over the world at this time, right? Deep, deep depression. 
street parades and demonstrations are part of workers theater and i read that this over this week uh, in the masses and i'm like holy fuck this just blew my mind about the role of protest and the role of art and theater in our in our protests, right? The RCMP tells about a parade here in Edmonton. There's about 1,700 people, and you can see the art, right? An old wagon drawn by five members of the party loaded with sacks of sawdust. They had capital that was written on the sacks of sawdust, right? Then there was fascism, capitalism, and war. Those were actors. And then they had, following the wagon, more actors that were ultimately um, making their point completely silently, but as they paraded through, um, through Edmonton and made a point potentially bigger and better than any speech could have done. Andrea Hassenbank, I want her voice here because she's just so, makes such an amazing point. So I'll read it because it just needs to be read directly. The masses presented its readers not just with politics, but with alternative ways of living within capitalist society. Instead of being an unemployed veteran, one could be a theater performer. Instead of being an underpaid shop girl, one could be a poet. Instead of being a silent target of the law, one could learn how to go to court to defend oneself and others. In a time when people fell on themselves reduced to a series of demographic markers and were oftentimes judged not worthy of relief and care, the ability to attain agency and creativity must have seemed transformative. Activism on the left asks a lot of its supporters. There are always more marches to join, more calls to make, more money to donate. Does that sound familiar? Political parties and issue-oriented groups would do well to look beyond the campaign to see what kinds of lives their supporters are leading and what kinds of needs are left unanswered. The integral part of that 1930s labor print played in working class culture, it's instructive for the current left. Its lessons are clear. In the absence of art, culture, and creativity, there is no movement. So how does politics and art intersect? Have I made a case for it? I wanted to kind of go back to Rome, actually. The organization of many of the gladiator and the, the zoos and the circuses in Rome, um, that was a spectacle. That was art and that was theater as well. But what kind of theater was that? That was art that was used by the powerful to dull their people, right? That was, they were used to dull their people so that the people wouldn't go, holy hell, what kind of life do I have? And you're the reason for it, right? And so I want to just acknowledge that art is a tool that can go both ways. And as artists, we need to be conscious of this. As viewers of art, we also have to ask ourselves, what is the intention of this art? How is this moving me? And is it moving me in a way that connects with all the other kind of frameworks that I hold dear? I came across this awesome quote just to end this. History is made by a thousand hands. I love that. It's made by a thousand hands, by a thousand mouths, a thousand ideas, a thousand pieces of art. It's things that make you feel something bigger, grander than you ever might be on your own. While the Progressive Arts Club was pretty short-lived, um, I would argue that they were part of a movement that brought us EI, that brought us an eight-hour working day, that brought us a five-day working week. They brought us public health care. We can go on and on about the kinds of society that got built during that time when social democracy was something that the elites thought that meh, maybe we can use it. Perhaps it was intended to have us all chill out. Um, but at the end of the day, um, those things, I would say, were hard fought and hard won by this movement. So art is key, I guess, in one ways to these bigger movements. And the final thing I'll say is that art is key, I think, even maybe more importantly, to what it does inside of us. Art is key to both reflecting on cultural changes and being at the forefront of cultural changes. The practice of art making for us individually as artists, even if you don't think of yourself as an artist, it's spiritual, it's meaning making. It brings an awareness of the bigger world around us, an awareness of our interrelatedness and our interconnection. So it's an inside-outside strategy. Art works on the outside strategy, but it also, so critically, works on this inside strategy. And we're gonna hear more, for more from Nomadic about that exact thing. Thank you. Thank you, Carissa, and I'm hoping we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A um, a little bit after, but in the meantime, I'd like to bring Nomadic up, have him share a little bit with you. Hello. 
Um, a lot of the work that I do is about trying to be. Uh, for me, arts is survival, um, and arts is political. Arts is meant to make a change directly, whether you want to or not. That's one thing I want to emphasize today. Often, we talk about uh, how we are not easily susceptible or how we may not be influenced to things around us. However, art is very good at efficiently making us feel things without even us recognizing. The brain is a superpower. Its responsibility is to make you eat, sleep, and survive. The rest is whatever. It'll create, it'll hallucinate, it will try to imagine whatever, but its main responsibility is to try to keep you surviving. Sometimes that survival mentality overrides our empathy and our kindness because it makes us comfortable. And when you get comfortable, you're no longer growing. And when you aren't growing, you aren't accepting new views. And when you aren't accepting new views, you're out of commission, in my honest opinion. Because as human beings, we are computers. And our experience is our software. And in order for us to get a better understanding of our surroundings, we need to experience it. The best example of this is if you wanted to listen to iTunes, you could. But you can't without the software. You need to download the software first and then access the iTunes. It exists, but you need the software. Similar thing to trying to understand racism or ignorance or prejudice or homophobia. It's one of those things where you have to live it. And it's hard to explain it. One thing I try to tell people all the time or the example I try to give is, uh, have you ever bought shoes, cars, or clothes before you bought them? You barely see them around, but the moment you buy them, you notice them everywhere? That's lived experience. It always existed. But the moment that it became relevant to our life did we start paying attention to that. It's the same reason why if you're driving a Harley Davidson, you see another Harley Davidson, you go, hey, what up, beep, beep. It's that recognition. And that falls back to the most important thing I want to talk about today, which is identity. A lot of people are lacking identity. And it's so easy to use art to manipulate people to fit them into groups that they may not necessarily belong to. Some examples are incels, the right-wing groups, a lot of the extremist and Islamic uh, militia groups, these people are searching for identity. In 2008, there was a lot of Somali youth who were going back to Somalia and being involved in extremist acts. The government of Canada is like, that's a concerning factor. All young Somali boys, let us educate you on how you can prevent being recruited to extremists. They said the things you need to look out for are, A, they'll say it's us versus them. Then they say we need to go back to how it used to be. Isn't that what politicians are doing right now? Yeah. This is exactly what's happening to a lot of the young white males. It's exactly the same thing, but it's the context is different. And so they are still utilizing art to make them feel this way. That's where memes come in, right? That's where the social media movements come in, is because they're utilizing these arts to make people feel like they need a sense of belonging. And it's so easy for us to feel like we aren't susceptible to these things because we are. We're computers. Honestly, it's exact same. If you aren't constantly updating your software, which is educating yourself, you're susceptible to viruses. There's always new viruses coming in. So if you aren't preparing yourself or educating yourself by A, experiencing different cultures and arts, then you are susceptible to viruses and incels and right wing. These to me are viruses because no human being is born with the capacity to hate. We are all born with love. We are all born empathetic. It's society that contributes to who we become in order for us later on to feel like a, an identity or a sense of belonging. I, as a Muslim, challenged my parents a lot. I asked questions all the time and they hated it. But I'm glad that I did, because that's the most important thing. That's what art does. Art asks questions. I'm going to read a poem to you guys, which is like a rap, and um, like a rap slash poem thing. And it's about asking questions. Have you ever felt lost in a room full of maps? Or been in a cubicle with a passport in hand that's naked of stamps? I have. And it gives me the cramps. Or have you ever been to a library which is supposed to be this database of knowledge, but instead it's only used for getting quotes for university or college? Crazy logic, or how we consider those whose dollars don't make sense psychotic, sort of like we think slavery has been abolished, when in actuality it's been revamped, reshaped, and polished because we went from masters to master cars. Now don't be alarmed. Just as long as you don't sell it and you feed your spirit of freedom, your soul will never stop. But isn't it alarming? How we traded money for essential skills like hunting and farming, as if paper and lead is going to keep us fed in a crisis when we're starving? 
Now, I'm not saying all of them, but the governments are corrupted. The aliens are amongst us, and our minds have been abducted. And this is their laboratory. We've always been test subjects. And they're not beaming us up. They're keeping us down, because these squares know the right angles just to keep us around. And that's why I'm not defined by a border or a region. The lack of order from the government's only one of the many reasons I'd never pledge allegiance to government changing face like the weather be changing seasons. They're seedless. Funny they got branches but no roots, so how could this be treason? Sad that we believe in. A bunch of rulers, if we try to measure up, we'd never come out even. Now you could try to switch the metric, but they say you can't defeat me. Our life is just a game in a crooked system they created. It makes it absolutely easy to play us nine to five, the minimum wage us, and those of us who are courageous, they cage us and jail us, God save us. Man, I hope the system doesn't swallow me. But if I resist, they'll get a special agent to follow me when really, I'm not a bad guy, but because I like to use my noodle, they consider me nutty like Pat Tart. Plus, nine to five is the only way to make it, some say. There's no one way. I'd rather be a rapper and a poet, even if it meant I stayed underground like a subway, because then I'd still be on track, training for my final destination, because life is a big show and being yourself is the only way to prepare for that final presentation. So with that poem, what I'm trying to explain is, thank you. What I'm trying to explain with that poem is there's a lot of things we don't ask questions about and we just follow orders or we just follow how it's been done. As artists, our job is to say, are you sure that's how it's done? There's another way, there's another avenue because we are all born lawyers, engineers, artists, doctors. It's what we spend our time on that define us. And society doesn't allow us to be artists. That's why people who are artists often get another job is because they feel like art isn't a career, but art is used in everything. If you ever see a political rally, there is music in the background. They invite artists to speak because they recognize that artists have the capacity to change and to make a movement. I want you to be constantly asking questions, even within your own directives and motives. Because if you aren't challenging yourself, then again, you are susceptible to ignorance. Ask yourself, why do I feel this way? Or why did I think that? Or how come I feel this way? It's important to continuously question yourself. Otherwise, then you are susceptible to ignorance. And for me as a human being, the most negative or the worst thing that you could do is to allow others to imprint who they think you are. Because either you speak or you are spoken for. And artists speak for those who don't have an op opportunity to speak at times. And it's a heavy duty of responsibility to carry, but I try to hold it with a sense of selfishness to a degree, because I'm a human being. One thing art made me realize is that no one is against us, everyone is for themselves. I can't hate on the conservative movement or the conservative government, but I can hate on the individuals who intentionally do things that are hurtful towards my communities. It sucks that we uh, become groups and we separate each other and isolate each other because we all have many different identities within, it, within that. We probably have conservative or NDP or liberal values. And I hate that I have to choose this or that when in reality what we're trying to do is we're trying to decipher who really cares about individuals. And because we don't have enough artists questioning folks or we don't have enough arts in the schools, people aren't critically thinking. And when you aren't critically thinking, you are susceptible to viruses. Let me try something really quickly. And I've done this, so if you see me around, you know where this is going. Everybody, I want you to go like this for a second. Try it out. I want you to take this and put it underneath your chin really quickly. I said your chins. <laughs> Some of you did great, but I said your chins. How come you did what I did rather than what I said? It's because actions speak louder than words. It's a fact. So as an artist, not only am I creating art, I'm living my art 24-7. That means whether it's through resistance, regardless of who is in government, regardless of who is in power, regardless if it's in my family, our duty is to speak up. And you are an artist. That's what I want to remind you. That's part of your identity, to create. We are fooled into thinking that magic is deception with a sleight of hand. That's not magic. Art is magic. You create something from thin air that nobody will ever be able to replicate, ever, no matter how hard they try. I work with students regularly. I have an exercise where I ask them, hey, give me five words randomly. And then they toss random five words. Sometimes it's crazy, a uh, turtle, and then it's like um, universe. And I'm like, okay, fine. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take your words, and I'm going to put them into a sentence. And I usually do. Now I say, give me new five words. Now you guys put it into a sentence, or into a poem. 99.9% .9 of the time, it's different. They have the same words, I'm the same instru uh, structure, the same instructions, but the writing is different. Yeah. It's because we all think and behave differently. Yeah. Right now, if I say the word red, 
your brain is thinking of so many different things, but the only thing that comes to the forefront is what your brain thinks is important. And so you can train your brain to think what's important, which is empathy, kindness, consideration. In my family, I don't ever try to educate my family. I don't ever tell them, hey, that's, uh, this is what you should know. If somebody says something ignorant, I go, not around me. No, it's not happening, not around me. You can do whatever you'd like, because that's not my job to control you, but you are not going to say that while I am present. And if you are, I'm going to continuously harass you about it. That's my job. As artists, that's the same thing we do constantly, right? The same thing we do. Chris was talking about earlier about how arts can be good and bad. My responsibility is to demonstrate that art is good, but you definitely are susceptible to the bad. So we're talking about this thing for a second, how even though I am telling you directly, you are following my actions. And so a lot with my children at home, which is influenced, again, by the arts understandings, I never tell my daughters what to do. I start it by directing. Like, I start. I say, hey, come help me clean your room really quickly. And then we go to the room. They start up, and I walk away. Right? I started with them. But the idea behind this is it's a collective collaboration. A lot of young white men are feeling attacked. It's a reality. And I'll explain to you. That's because of comfort. For so long, there has never been any issue that they had to deal with, in my honest opinion, to the degree of feeling like they need to question their identity, they need to question their, uh, uh, their sexuality, they need to question their gender. It's never happened, and it's uncomfortable. Same thing with the police. A good friend of mine, Bashir Mohammed, did everything possible to try to get to the police to understand that, yo, having police officers in the school is uncomfortable. And they're like, no, it's not. They're not being empathetic. They're looking at it from the perspective of a white person who's never had harassment from a police officer. I was 17 when I first got arrested, and I'm going to share this poem with you. Because often, these are the experiences that people don't get to see that people of color experience. And that's why if somebody who has a different sexual orientation or religion ever comes with me with an issue, first thing I do is I listen. Because it could be true. It may be true. My job isn't to say whether it is or isn't true. It's to give them an opportunity to express that reality. Because to them, it's a reality. And now what's difficult for edu educators, artists, social uh, people with social movement is this cur is current government is not listening at all. They're not willing to listen to anything that we are saying. They're creating war rooms instead of creating art. Right? Like it's crazy that they're funding money towards propaganda rather than towards the arts. And it's a challenge because if you don't have people who come from the community who are artists or who were part of the community before they got elected, this is what we get. These are, in my opinion, career politicians. Like, I love a few people in politics because of who they are. Janice Irwin, David Shepard, David Egan. These are people I know personally, and I knew way before they got elected, or even before they knew who I was, and so I value and treasure them, because I can go up to them and be like, hey, quick question. Yeah, and I know that it's not gonna come from a political perspective, but they definitely tell me, yeah, Ahmed, but considering this, and I'm like, yeah, that's good. But if I'm not allowed to contribute my own perspective to that reality, it makes a change. So here is a story, and this is the true story that happened to me. My parents are gone, they're in Somalia, I'm 16 years of age, I have absolutely no family members because my brothers are in Ontario, but they're not living in Kitchener, Ontario with me. The school I was going to was called Eastwood. Their mascot was a rebel with a Confederate flag. I'm not even joking with you, they changed it in 2005. It was one of the worst experiences living in Kitchener, but I'm grateful because it taught me what not to do. Hmm. You know, it taught me how not to hurt or how not to hate other people because we're all different and our responsibility is to accept and welcome people because we all are an amalgamation of experiences we've accumulated. And so it's important. So I was 17 when I got arrested. There was nothing cool about the moments that led to it either. I didn't get arrested for robbing a bank or anything cool like that. Now I know what you're thinking. What's so cool about robbing a bank, Ahmed? <laughs> nothing. But as far back as I can remember, man, I've always wanted to be where money made me feel like I didn't have to worry about walking 45 minutes to rest my head where I no longer had to lie to my friends about having just eaten. But in that instance of me thinking about robbery and bank, thoughts on my dad promising to run across the ocean fast enough to alter space and time just to kick my butt across my mind. Hmm. Now my father, he was in Somalia at the time, but he could have been in another planet, but he was never somehow, he was never too far for a lesson. Always close enough to stress the importance of struggle and how struggle is the essence of success. And that success is much like a tree, he would say because it takes a tree years to build branches with leaves big enough to fully appreciate sunlight. Everything that's worth something takes time, you'd say. Mm. Now, my father would often stretch the truth to teach me a lesson, but he never lied. And this only helps solidify that smart cough down my face. And like handcuffing me, the officer didn't hesitate to ask me if I thought this was funny. 
Now, Dave Chappelle and SpongeBob, that's funny. But this, this is more like a soap opera, a drama with each episode leading to more confusion. Sometimes it doesn't matter who you are. It's hard to accept what is foreign. So how do I translate the weight of expectations placed on a 17-year-old Somali boy's shoulders who can barely carry his life in his wallet? Now, at this moment, I'm assuming I'm either thinking of N.W.A. or Martin Luther King, because before I could realize how badly my brain just trolled me, the words F the police escaped my mouth. And like a volcano, he erupted. His composure could be seen flying that way. His reasoning, flying that way. Mm. And over him, a thick cloud of superiority was growing, and his words, you good for nothing, burn just like lava. Not guilty until proven innocent, right? He's just proving guilty for overlooking my innocence. So without hes hesitation, I apply a damn right to the conversation. And then he handcuffs me tight, and not knowing this, this is a point of comfort for me. This is the close I've gotten to embrace since my parents left when I was 15. These handcuffs on confinement in my apartment is visited. Inside, you will find my jail cell, a naked apartment stripped of its youth. No television, no couches. I rest my head on a pillow that has no record of sleep. When I brush my teeth, it's with watered-down toothpaste. When I shower, it's with dish soap. Check the cabinets. There are no traces of dishes there. Just a pot of tea on a stove that whistles, reminding me that sometimes things are going to get hot. And I'm allowed to scream. But I should step aside, and everything will be cool once again. But nothing prepared me for the waterfalls that ran down my face. I so badly wanted to ask him if he's ever prayed into an empty fridge hoping miracles to happen every five minutes you prayed. If he's ever philosophized as to whenever you're looking for spoons, why is it all you can find is forks? I so badly wanted to show my struggle is stitched to the fabric of my khakis people accuse me of wearing day in and day out. And how much like my shoes my soul was beginning to wear out. He didn't deserve these tears. But maybe they were necessary sacrifices for the situation. Because as the cop lowered me into the car, like a rainbow after a storm, a smile began to show. And like the kettle like, began to cool because my optimistic father popped into my head saying, hey, Ahmed, you're innocent. And at least you get to eat a free meal tonight. Thank you. I love art and I love social change. And I could talk about this all day long. So I'm just going to conclude it with this so that we can have a, a dialogue and conversation. And I have a lot to learn from you as well. My father would always say, if you wanted to, you could learn patience from a stone. And I love my father's perspective, because he's trying to say that you were always A, an educator, and B, always a student. And the moment you forget that you are a student, now you are a corrupt educator, because you are no longer learning to learn. Now you're just spewing. And so what I implore or empower you to do, what you can take back is get involved or be involved in diverse arts incorporate yourself or learn about different arts or different perspectives because whether you realize a lot of art is influenced by other art. Somali culture has a lot of different cultures. We say termus, we say sabun, which is an Urdu word. Like we say pasto, which is an Italian word. So there's so many different things and we need to remember that we are not just strictly one thing. We are everything and everyone at any given time. I am my ESL teacher who invested in me. I am Ricardo who said, Ahmed, are you interested? I am my family, my parents who invest their time in me. I am the community who says we believe in you. I am that, that's who I am. You may see the shell or you may see the image of who is being invested in, but I'm only carrying a light that's being supported by my community. Find artists who need help. We need to support our artists. Those are the people who are gonna bring the truth to the forefront. An example of this is, if I'm sure you guys may have heard of, Edward Bernays. The example which is Edward Bernays was Sigmund Freud's nephew, and they did a research where they said, hey, we want to increase smoking uh, publicly with women. And his responsibility was to try to find a way. And you can read in this, because I'm not gonna do it justice, but the whole idea was he worked with a photographer, worked with the media to say, this is an idea I have. And then he created this whole fake narrative, like women, you need to grab your uh, torches of freedom, your cigarettes, that's what he called them, your freedom torches and walk down to your town square and demand equal justice. And what do you think they did? They did that. And the moment that paper got shown, the next city did that. The next city did that. Within a few years, it increased publicly women smokers. And it goes to show that yes, art does make a change. And honestly, today the whole, uh, um, um, doing the protest and, and the rallies, I've never looked at it as theater. It is theater, right? It's people coming together to demonstrate something. It's a performance to say, yo, we're not standing for this anymore. So two things. One, make people around you who are saying things that are ignorant or wrong uncomfortable. Don't let them be comfortable in that ignorance. 
to find your identity. I know some of y'all are more mature than I am, but there's still an opportunity to find who you are, what you believe in, and what you value. As children, we know what we want, but as we age, society beats us down, man. Mm. It's hard. And also empower diversity. I don't mean skin color. I don't mean sexual orientation. I mean experiences. Because the experiences that those different colors and orientations give us is what's valuable at the table. It provides a different perspective, and it strengthens the community understanding. We need to change the narrative that diversity is a color thing, because a lot of young white men do not like that. And as me, as an educator and as a poet, I know that I have a responsibility that words for me are like food. If I was to give raw emotions, you better believe you'll get salmonella, emotional salmonella. So I have to cook my food accordingly, garnish it with words that you may be relevant to, a sense of belonging, words that might make you feel laugh or humor, and then maybe my words will be more recept uh, uh, acceptable or uh, uh, received by you. So again, make people uncomfortable, find your identity, but more than anything, support arts and artists. Find whatever you are. This is an example of me being here in an, uh, uh, um, an academic sense. I am grateful because artists, we often don't feel like we're valued in academia. So this is awesome. So nonetheless, um, I have a lot to learn from you guys as well. And there is a lot of work to do ahead, but um, as indigenous uh, elders said it best, we don't inherit the land, we borrow it from our grandchildren. So if you wanna make a change, start talking to your grandchildren and educating them because they are the future. Some of the politicians around, our, uh, around right now and some of the elders around are far gone, but the next generation can make a difference. Thanks. Um, Alberta and the prairies are the birthplace of the co-op movement. Our story of Alberta and the prairies is that we come together and do difficult things together as a community. We can see that we talked about the wheat board this morning. There's also things like the rural electrification associations where people got together to bring electricity to their homes. Uh, gas co-ops where they would do the same thing for natural gas to heat their homes. Uh, we have co-op grocery stores. And so I'm sort of wondering if you can help us understand, especially Chris as a historian, where did Alberta go astray? Like, you know, we knew that we could build good things together in communities. And then nowadays we have people that this sort of toxic individualism has come out of a province where we built this province by doing things together. So where did we go astray and how can we use art to get us back to our roots of, of doing things together and knowing that it's collectivism is our future and how we can achieve bigger things together. I feel like Angela described how we got here quite clearly, right? I think that the narrative of the, you know, individualistic Albertan is also a narrative that isn't always true. We hold a lot of those collectivistic values still, but the bigger global narrative that, that came with so much of the, neo, as you described, the neoliberalism that began to turn the tide on what had been the rise of social democracy through the, through, through the 20s and 30s. And I would say that social democracy, absolutely, that is part of our history here too. And so I guess I would argue that the narrative of the brash independent cowboy is a narrative that is not that is not us and it is not true but that also we have all these other pressures that are coming from that from the economic system that we currently work in and all of the things angela talked about this morning about the where the power is consolidated so i guess for me this uh, talk and and being forced to kind of go back to all my history like and and work and it's really made me think about how little, A, I hear about art in strat planning, how little we do see art, like in our com community, in these kind of gatherings, right? How many gatherings have I seen Chris over the course of the last two months? How many silly plays have there been? How many even just beautiful photos on a PowerPoint have there been? I think we can just do fucking better, right? Because that stuff is, is in us, right? I think it's about us, just uh, every one of us plans these things and maybe we need to just think a little bit about the Progressive Arts Club and go, hey, there is that way to get out and around just our intellectualism and our political theory and play with these things and think about beauty in these things and, and feel emotion in these things because these things are so emotional and the only way that we're allowed to feel is angry. And that is not what art does. It makes us angry, 
but holy hell, it makes us all sorts of other things. And that's, I question think, what art anger. can do. I mean, so you can anger. reply to, you know, respond yeah. to that too. So I come from, moved back from Ontario. My family first came to Edmonton in 91, went to Ontario, and I got back here. I, uh, I have a saying that I said, it's not mine, I heard it somewhere, they said, if you want to live in a city, live in Toronto, but if you want to build one, move to Edmonton. Uh-huh. Edmonton is awesome in the sense that I've felt like I've always received opportunity. There was never like a shutdown, like you're not going to grow here. But what has happened with the advent of social media is that it exploded what already existed down low. Like Trump wasn't the issue. Trump was is one of the ailments where you can see where he's he's not the illness. He's what do they call it again when you're starting to notice like the bumps, the symptoms. Yeah, that's what he is. There's way more. Alberta allowed the KKK to become a nonprofit organization. So that history always existed. It's just that it was hidden and it was in public view. Now people are okay with saying these things and it's okay to be hurtful and it's okay to be uh, misogynistic and it's okay to be manly in a weird way. So it, that social media allows people to do this and that's why I say make people feel uncomfortable. A comment like, what are you talking about? Like honest, people see this. Just make people feel uncomfortable. And another thing is, I was reading somewhere, Albertans, I think like 60, 70 plus have never left Alberta in their life. Yeah. That contributes a lot to ignorance because if you're not leaving the country or even learning or leaving your community, it happens. I have a friend of mine, I like to story, uh, 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 who's a family friend and he's married to my wife's cousin and he is Métis and uh, his wife is Filipina who came here as a refugee and is an immigrant and we're at a family gathering, at a Christmas gathering and he goes, ah, I'm tired of all these Syrians, Trudeau bringing uh, these Syrians coming into, they're going to rape all children. I said, why would you say that, man? He's like, all refugees come in here and all they do is whatever. I'm like, I'm a refugee? Everybody in this room is a refugee? Like, but I know you guys. And I'm like, go get to know more people then. <laughs> so that's the idea is know more people. I do feel like I hear that more and more, my own family members, friends, and it just comes out, I never quite know how to approach them, but you know, you were saying they've never been felt insecure before, so now they're dealing with it. But do you have any tips on how to uh, help them get outside their little box or their little narrow way of thinking? Um, Very good question. Subtly, whether they make them feel like they're the ones who want to make the change. Honestly, my dad used to say something that never made sense when I was younger, but as I aged, it made more sense. Somebody isn't ready to do something until they are ready to do something. You can't force somebody to be positive. You can't force them to be good, but you can surround them with that stuff, right? Like you can influence them by being proactive and by being supportive and making them feel uncomfortable because they're going to need to go through that. It's like sickness. Once you get ill, you can't just take that sickness out of somebody. They need to go through that. Your job is to support them and remind them that this sickness isn't who they are and that they need to think beyond that sickness, and that happens when you show them differently. A lot of racists or people who are KKK or ignorant eventually change, and they say, it's because I had a black friend or because I got to meet this person or because I got to do this. These people are surrounded by too much information that isn't relevant to them. And so just try to influence them or surround them and just support them. Because no matter what you do, if it already happened, your job is just to help them through that. But what I would say is if they have children, go to their children and get them books that are necessary, like teaching them about diversity and different cultures, get them involved in Diwali, get them involved in celebrating Chinese New Year's, get them to see as many different cultures as possible. Because when you are young, that's when you have the most synapses and most neurons. And later on, they'll have the blueprints. Because us, we already are traumatized and we already have challenges. So it's hard for us to overcome these things. It's almost like walking on a snow path. After you walk on it at certain times, you're not trying to get your feet wet by changing that path. You're comfortable, even if it's the longest road. So just try to make them uncomfortable. I uh, get the interfaith calendar every year from the local Edmonton Interfaith Center over here, and I give it to anyone and everyone who will accept it. And I heard my niece describing it to her at that point, eight-year-old daughter, and she said, oh, good, here's Auntie Lee's calendar. It's a whole year full of everybody's parties. That's That's what we need to hear. Honestly, we need to hear. And again, so because words are important, For me, as a person of color who is a Muslim, who is an African, I don't ever think people are inherently racist. They just don't know what they're doing sometimes. But one thing I say is privilege means access to information and the opportunity to benefit from it. Anybody can be privileged. We just need to give them that opportunity to recognize and how to utilize that privilege.
Carissa, your book, The Little Yellow House, uh, struck a chord with me when I saw the description. I also lived the Alberta Ave perpetual renovation <laughs> of life <laughs> and tried to live into community. And it's exciting and interesting and it intensely psychological. And you can have very different experiences, even a few houses down in any direction. Um, and Nomadic, I wanted to try to incorporate a little bit in a question about what you're speaking about, about privilege and try to frame it in terms of how people come together because I feel like there's something about calling people out. Uh, and when I look at the spectrum right now, obviously it's polarized. And I think it's maybe not so mysterious why because I can see why people have gone further in either direction. So if you two can elaborate on a vision for workers, because I see this in the art. Um, Chris, when you showed the art of communism, I see sort of certain things portrayed like muscle and strength and collectivism mm -hmm. and so on, mm -hmm. and that's empowering. Mm -hmm. The house vision, it's appealing here in Edmonton, no matter you point out coming back to Edmonton, you feel like the doors are open, like there's, there's opportunity here. And I feel that's right, and like our affordable housing is a big attraction. So I wondered if you could speak on, just in a moment, in a few words, just a collective vision where, where people can buy into what would be a modern worker culture, because I feel like I really appreciated your points on identity nomadic. Basically, if you're not speaking, you're spoken for. And I feel like we're being sold a vision on elevation somehow, which is actually destabilizing for most people. And the people who are you know, called privileged, who I used to look at as privileged, actually they're very insecure, uh, partly owing to how little unionism they have. So even if they're making more money, they often are kind of in a boom-bust cycle. That includes a lot of people in like oil sector. And if they don't buy into their party line, they're out pretty quick. So like a lot of those people are insecure really fundamentally in some way. Can you just share some last words on your vision where people can build community in Edmonton? This sounds very pessimistic, but I try to make people feel uncomfortable and try to educate them through the words that I use. And often I'm invited in spaces that aren't typical to artists. I sat on the Law Enforcement Review Board of Alberta. I was at the Arts Council where I chaired as the equity uh, chair there. And again, my responsibility is just to remind people. They say, hey, I'm going to bring more diversity to the Arts Council. I go, you need to go find more diversity. <laughs> They're not going to come to you. So my job is just to remind them of these things. And that comes from the experiences that I brought. And I don't try to change or work with adults. I work with youth because they're the future. And they're malleable. And I don't lead them. My father would say the best educator and mentors aren't those who build you, but those who give you the tools to build yourself. And so I'm preparing them now with all the tools necessary to recognize what it is to be who they are. Because again, identity is a compass. And until you calibrate yourself, you're lost. You don't know where you're going. And anybody can direct you everywhere. So I'm just working with youth. That's my perspective. If I, you're asking me about the vision for a modern worker sort of movement, I would start with emotional intelligence. So much of our conversations um, on a broad perspective, and I guess emotional intelligence I hear is what you've been speaking about this yeah. whole time, Nomadic. But one of the things that in my his, historical reviews too that comes out is campaigning and advocacy and activism is, a, is you have multiple, it is a multi-plane kind of type of work because you need to show distinctly how you're different in order to win, win you know, whatever, you're at the contract table, at the negotiation table, or at the political table, or whatever you might be, you have to show that there is a difference between me and you. To be an activist, you need to have these sort of tactical sort of abilities of differentiating us and them. Us and them does not work, though, when you try and do anything. Right? Us and them only works to try and move the needle on people's beliefs, perhaps, right? And obviously move the needle on certain policy ideas. It's not small. But the challenge is because our brains are often trained towards us and them, because it needs to be in certain tactical, strategic places and spaces. We actually don't know how to translate into spaces where we have to actually work together and collaborate. We don't know how to shed that us and them and work with each other in a space that is exactly what you're saying, Ahmed. It's just that is you and I have a lot to learn from each other. How can we move forward in a way that benefits all of us? The future movement, my vision for it, would be that it is a deeply self-reflective one, one that has emotional intelligence that says we want leaders that 
aren't just good at outlining what's good and bad, but are out leaders that actually can bring us together and bring disparate groups together to be able to come up with the really hard solutions to very, very complex problems. So I think navigating that balance where we have to be as simple as possible, but we're doing it, but we're actually dealing with the most complex things ever. That's going to be our challenge, and I would love to see us all sort of commit to emotional intelligence, which comes from, I think, our art. One thing as well, just to very quickly say, is and get people to start thinking of what can they do for me, and instead start thinking what they can do for us. Because so many people are thinking about me, right? And it's about us, we. We're connected. If you throw a rock into a lake, the ripple may not reach the end, but it still affects the lake. So it still affects us. Thank you, everybody, for being here. And thank you for ending us on that note of solidarity. Let's give our speakers a round, warm round of applause. <laughs>